Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father has promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. The Gospel of the Lord. So whenever I have to preach on the ascension of Jesus Christ, I typically tackle it with humor. Because it's sort of a ridiculous thing. And often when I have to preach on it, I will point to all the bizarre and absurd like paintings and things that are out there that depict the ascension of Christ. And so often if you've ever seen a, I've reached that point in pregnancy, or like I'm out of breath all the time, <laughs> so I sound like I've run a marathon. So anyway, regardless, um, so if you've ever seen a picture painted of the ascension of Jesus Christ, like he's like up here right in the clouds and he's glowing, or the other one that's very popular is you can just see Jesus' feet dangling between earth and heaven, right? I mean, these are grossly, you know, weird portrayals of Jesus. However, this absurdity actually brings me a great amount of comfort. Because if the ascension is difficult to capture in art, then why would it be any different in a sermon? It's an uncomfortably strange text, which has often caused me to wonder why. I mean, why all the special effects and drama? Now, it's true that we can draw scholarly parallels between the transfiguration, the rapture of Elijah, and then the ascension. But that's just sort of an intellectual exercise, which doesn't really illustrate the point. Honestly, all of this drama, just so the Holy Spirit can then arrive on the scene, I mean, it just doesn't really seem to fit in about what we know about Jesus and his typical behavior and course of action. And so is there more to this spectacular ending to an almost unbelievable story? Now, even though I have preached on the Ascension almost every year that I've been a pastor, I have predominantly brushed it to the side, mostly because, as I said, you know, it seems so absurd, and I really couldn't understand how this was going to help me grow in my faith. It's just the precursor to Pentecost, and I like Pentecost a lot more. But this year, it was a little bit different. Maybe it was happenstance, maybe it was coincidence, or maybe it was divine intervention. But this year, a piece of the ascension, and I believe a crucial piece, was unlocked for me in a most unexpected place. An advice column. Now, I don't regularly read advice columns. Actually, I never, ever read them. But as I have mentioned to a few people recently, I just finished a book called Tiny Beautiful Things, and it is, as the title suggests, beautiful. Not beautiful in a glowing, glimmery, otherly kind of fashion, but beautiful in the laying oneself bare, honestly and fearlessly fashion. And the entire book is comprised of letters to an online advice columnist named Sugar. So, it is filled with all those things that people ask about when anonymity is guaranteed. They ask about life, like the real things in life, right? You know, affairs, job failures, physical insecurities, lost dreams, grief, money troubles. And they pour their heart out to this person that they will never, ever meet which in and of itself is a little bit sad. But I inhaled the poignancy of their words, breathing them in like air for my soul. Now before I go on, if you decide to read this book because I mentioned it in a sermon, please know that it's full of harsh and vulgar, vulgar language, probably more than is necessary. And it's not 
filled with feel-good stories, but rather the crudeness and brokenness of life. And I'm sure that some of the letters will appall you. But sugar responds to each person with candor, truth, dignity, and humor. And towards the end of the book, she unintentionally makes the most concise, theologically accurate, radiant explanation of the implication of the ascension of Jesus Christ that I have ever read. She writes this to a man who is a former addict, who is agonizing over his wife's drug relapse. And this is what she says. The thing about rising is we have to continue upward. The thing about going beyond is we have to keep going. I'm telling you, that is the best statement on the ascension I've ever heard. I mean, it's really like my whole sermon in 21 words, but I sort of felt obligated to say a little bit more. Um, but so she, the reality she states answers the why question. You know, why Jesus ascended. It answers why this is a crucial piece to Easter. It also answers why the ascension matters to me and why it matters for you. So let me break it down a little bit. Why did Jesus ascend? Well, Sugar's answer would be, the thing about rising is we have to continue upward. The thing about going beyond is we have to keep going. On that glorious Easter morning when Jesus was raised by God, he couldn't just not continue upwards. For Jesus to have stayed put would have meant he would have stagnated. Jesus wasn't meant to just rise one time. He was meant to continue rising. Because the essence of his very life is resurrection, rising, <coughs> ascending. Jesus was so filled with the spirit of resurrection that he has, had to keep going on, onwards and upwards. Leaving the tomb was just the beginning. Just the beginning for Jesus and just the beginning for us. At the heart of Christianity lives the verb rising. Once in a theological discussion on various foundations of different faiths, I had a professor in seminary say, if we ever give up the resurrection, we lose everything about Christianity. At that time, I disagreed with her somewhat. My conception of what the resurrection meant surrounded Jesus' bodily resurrection on Easter morning. And I believed in that, and I still do. But I thought, well, Jesus showing up on Easter morning is not all there is to Christianity. And it's not. But that's not what she's meant. I learned a few things since my first semester in seminary. She meant we cannot ever give up on the truth that God promises to raise us from the dead, to raise us from the ashes, to raise us from whatever devilish temptations come our way. Now, sugar is not Jesus. In fact, she states in the book that she doesn't believe in God in a classical sense. Her words, her words are so very often Jesus' words. And as I, re as I read her book, I distinctly remember thinking, if I could write like that, then what I say might actually make a difference, might actually make people rise, might actually make people ascend beyond themselves and their plights. Because I would read the letters that people wrote, and I would read her responses with tears in my eyes and laughter in my heart. And I would think, surely these people must rise. They absolutely must rise from the situations they paint for this woman. Because her advice is so true, and so honest, and so spot on, that I couldn't help but transcend my own stuff for that moment. I believe that the people who wrote to Sugar opted to transcend, to rise, to go beyond, to ascend, <coughs> rather, than, rather than to continue to live the same old tale. And I choose to believe this not because Sugar is a gifted writer, but rather because what she writes is gospel truth. And the gospel always sets people free. She encourages people to live in the aftermath of the resurrection, live into the ascension, Earlier, I wondered out loud why all the drama and the special effects were necessary to end Jesus' story. But this point in our text isn't how the story ends. It's simply where it takes a surprising turn. 
The moment of ascension is when the living beyond of oneself begins, the continuation of the resurrection. It was true for Jesus, it was true for the disciples, and it's true for us. When the disciples are, are present at the ascension, it is the one time, the one time that the disciples finally get that change is part of blessing. And so whether we've had an interesting, hilarious, tragic, or lovely life, the surprising turns that we may encounter are never the ends, but rather the space where the ascension begins. And we may grieve the changes and surprises that we encounter in life, and rightly so. However, blessing comes not in the reception of good things in life, but rather the blessing is that the Spirit will not let us linger in the ashes, will not let us linger in the tomb, and the Spirit will not even let us linger just in the glow of the resurrection. The Spirit always pushes upwards. Because as Sugar would say, the thing about rising is we have to continue upward. The thing about going beyond is we have to keep going. So how would your letter begin? Dear Sugar, I'm writing to you today because, and no matter what words she used to respond, the message would be Jesus' message. Keep rising. Keep going. Because this is what your Ascension Day looks like. And isn't it glorious?